for to join us, Pratik, whenever you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm excited to give my first polar talk. Um, the first three people who sat in the front row are going to get some goodies. Oh, yeah. so this is a, um, oh, this yeah, is a the VR. This is a uh, some virtual reality thing. You can try it out and awesome. tell me about it. This is a drum. Oh my goodness! Oh. Oh. Thank you. So this is to keep you fit. Oh wow! Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's. Uh, we're recording this. Yep. <clears throat> All right, let's get let's get started. So, uh, two weeks ago, I spent a week uh, in the valley at a place called Singularity University. Um, made a lot of money to go to the one week course. So I learned a lot, and uh, I got inspired. And I learned a lot of different things. Uh, and I got so inspired, I put together a bunch of notes and a bunch of slides that I want to share that with all of you. And uh, step outside of the polar world for 20 minutes, and let's explore the exciting world of exponential technologies. No comments, no effects, no? Ooh! <laughs> wow. Prezi! Well, it's because so Jacqueline has done it already, I right? I the ice so, with the Prezi yeah. so. We can all learn there. <laughs> 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 Learning curve is okay. Anyways, yeah. <laughs> so um, I want to distinguish between the Singularity and Singularity University, just so we're not confused. So the Singularity is this uh, event that a guy by the name of Ray Kurzweil has predicted in 2045, where a machine becomes smarter than men, and machine may do things to men. Uh, Singularity University, uh, although Kurzweil is involved in starting it, a slightly different vision. And it's around how to use all of the exponential technologies to make the world a better place. And it's looking at a long time horizon of 10 to 20 years. So it's not as much about the world being over. Uh, it's more about how to use technology for good and how to understand what's happening uh, in the world of technology. So I want to talk about the, the power of exponential. And, and this is an exponential curve, and a lot of us have seen these before. Um, in one week in the Valley at Singularity, I s saw the exponential curves at nauseum, and that I'm sick of the exponential curves. Um, but it is so ingrained. So um, something that really stuck with me, which one of the speakers talked about, was uh, they compared um, taking a linear step versus an exponential step. And uh, picture how far we go if we take 30 linear steps go from here to probably where the couch is. Uh, 30 exponential steps takes us from here to the moon. And that really speaks to the difference um, and the power of the exponential. In a technology context, exponential is very much around Moore's law. So a um, guy who started Intel a couple decades ago and predicted that the cost um, is going to uh, cut, get cut in half and the capacity it's going to double every 18 to 24 months within um, computing hardware and computing technology. And he made that prediction, or that theory, about 30 to 40 years ago, and it's held true. But what's been really interesting is that's actually held true in a lot of other industries. So Moore's law, um, as really the law of exponential curves, is being applied, and we're seeing it everywhere around us, whether we realize it or not. I mean, this company um, has experienced uh, parts of the power of exponential. In our first six months of launching our, our native ads platform, we had served 100 million ads. In the following six months, we had served 900 million ads. In the following 12 months, we served 9 billion ads. And in the following 12 months, well, let's see what we can do together. Um, but the, the power of exponential uh, is exciting, and there's a, lot, there's a lot to it. So that was a bit about Moore's Law and how and this is a logarithmic curve, so we're seeing it in a linear fashion, but it's, um, you see the scale here and how it's growing exponentially. So we look at some of the problems in the world and some of the, you know, what's referred to as the global grand challenges. These are all areas that we hear about in the press, we read about, and uh, uh, they're all areas that a lot of companies, a lot of people care about. Uh, there's a belief at the Singularity University that a lot of these exponential technologies can positively influence and help solve some of these problems that we have. So I want to get into some of the things that, that caught my attention and that I wanted to share. So I want to start with transportation. So 1.2 million people die every year in car accidents. 40% of that is tied to drunk driving. Robots don't drink. 
And when we look at where um, technology within transportation can evolve, um, this is really what it's about, is lowering this number. So is that a US number or a worldwide? This is worldwide. Um, and then 25% of our energy needs are for cars. Um, so there's a lot happening already. And there's these two different approaches that are emerging. There's companies that are thinking of the car with a computer, and there's companies that are thinking of a computer with wheels. So the manufacturers that you would know of, um, so Volvo has said by 2017 they'll have 100 self-driving cars on the road. The Mercedes 2016 E-Class has self-driving capabilities. Tesla has come out and said they have self-driving capabilities. Uber has made some big investments and is investing in building this technology. Uh, and then Google, who we all know, has invested a lot in this. Um, their self-driving cars have driven 1.8 million kilometers autonomously, which is more than all the other companies combined. Uh, and then governments are also getting on board. So we learned about a lot of examples of how governments are also racing to become the next center of autonomous driving. Same way Detroit and Ontario and a few other places have become the center of traditional automobiles. Um, there's this wave coming uh, in transportation and a lot of cities have caught on to it. And up in you know, the last 100 years, the evolution of transportation has very much been on the engine. But now it's actually moving, and the focus of control is moving towards the computer, um, away from the engine. So people that were very good at the engine versus the people that are very good at the computer is how you see these two um, approaches. And both are happening. It's a pretty interesting result. So let's um, let's look at the Google car. Um, you got to see one of these, play with it. <clears throat> this is the third generation of their self-driving car. There's no steering wheel, there's no brake, there's no gas. Did you ride the one? Uh, I didn't get to go with this one. I went in a second generation one, which is the Lexus um, SUV, which is also weird because my parents have the same car. <laughs> okay, so the reason this piqued my interest is I think it really changes everything. So what if I told you that um, your kids, maybe not your kids, JP, because <laughs> they're a little older than the, a lot of the kids that aren't born here yet. Uh, but your, your unborn kids uh, will never learn how to drive. My grandkids. Your grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> so I told you, JP's grandkids will never learn how to drive. When we look at uh, the concept of ownership, I told you that you're you may in the future, or your kids definitely will actually never own a car. When we think of how a relationship with cars, and it's a pretty expensive purchase outside of houses, it's probably the most expensive. Um, the question will be not what type of car do I want, what type of car do I need for this trip? 80% of car rides happen with a single person in them. And then something like parking. Think of um, Think of all of the real estate in urban centers that's dedicated to parking. And think of what happens in a world of autonomous cars where cars actually never park. They're picking you up from here to there and then they're gonna go pick somebody else up from there to there. And our cities, our roads, our highways, our driveways, real estate have profound effects because of a computer with wheels. So that's, that's what got me thinking, got me interested. So we're now going to get it now. I can, I can <laughs> do it. the car business. <laughs> I would love that. Car for everyone? No? <laughs> um, so then on the flip side, though, um, what's going to happen, but more importantly, how are we going to react when this happens with an autonomous car? For whatever reason, we're more comfortable with drunk humans killing other humans than robots killing humans. So the thing about autonomous cars and transportation is that uh, perfection is not the goal. It's not to take that 1.2 million fatalities down to zero. It's actually just to bring the 1.2 million fatalities down. So the, the goal is actually to be better than humans. But there will be accidents. <laughs> and over the next few years, I suspect we are going to see fatalities within autonomous cars. And I think the true test on our society is how are we going to react? And are we going to pull the plug 
and say, no, thank you, I'm not signing up for this, or understand and accept that this is part of the evolution. And the goal of being better than humans is being achieved. So that was on, on transportation, which I, um, <clears throat> definitely got me thinking. Uh, let's move on to a very popular topic of, of AI. So there is a lot happening. Uh, these are some of the companies that are investing a ridiculous amount of money right now. Uh, so IBM with Watson, it wasn't just a gimmick to like beat the Jeopardy dude um, a little while ago. Uh, it's an entire business and platform and revenue stream and strategy for IBM. Um, you know, Google spent $400 million buying a company called DeepMind. Um, one of our uh, angel investors was also an investor in that company. And uh, Facebook has been investing a lot. They've made a bunch of acquisitions in this space. So these companies are investing heavily. And um, over the last 20, 30 years and the last 10 years, when these companies invest in something, they really turn it into an industry. There's been a track record of that. So um, there's a lot being poured into uh, AI. So what are the applications of AI? So AI is not some futuristic thing that hasn't happened yet. It's actually happening every single day to all of us. Right, so voice recognition in Siri that sits in our iPhone and all of the other evolutions, that is a form of AI. Uh, image recognition, which is happening. Um, Facebook's image recognition algorithm is now at 97% accuracy. Humans are at 98%. So those are two very simple examples that we interact with on a, on a regular basis. But if we look at the future and where um, AI could really make a difference, outside of serving the right ad to the right person, um, you look at sectors like education. And the way we learn, um, was okay. A lot of us, a lot of us who started the company didn't really go to class. So it, was, it was a very different experience than what could be possible in a world of AI. What if education was one-on-one -on -one and personalized for every single person? Um, where it was personalized to you based on what your needs were and how you learn and what you struggle with. And then healthcare. What if healthcare was personalized versus the one-to-many uh, approach that we have today? Um, I shared with a few of you earlier today decision making. Um, there's an example where an AI is now sitting on a corporate board of directors. In the future, will an AI sit on every single board as a participant, as a way to bring in information and provide an objective, analytical opinion? So those are some of the AI applications kind of present and future that got me thinking. Um, some AI myths that I, um, that I wanted to share that I liked. Um, first one, myth that more data is better. And the truth is that garbage in is garbage out. Uh, there's a myth that smart algorithms are the same as human intelligence. Um, the algorithms today are very good at specific things, but outside of context, they start to break down. Met the AI technology is the most important thing. Uh, and the truth is, uh, framing the problem is the critical step. And a few of you have done some exercises with over the last week. And we spent a lot of time framing the problem and asking ourselves what the problem is. Uh, and that's actually more important than the, than the technology itself to solve it. And then AI met that there's a perfect system. AIs come with tons of trade offs. And uh, we need to be open and real to that. It's faster and cheaper, um, potential job disruption, disruption, a culture shift, um, a lot of implications with AI. And there's a lot of um, there was a lot of talk around what does it mean to build AI in an ethical and moral way, um, especially over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, so verification was one theme. Is that is it according to spec? The validity is it specific and valid? Uh, security. That's a pretty obvious one, so it can be tampered with. And then control, is there a plug if the system goes off the rails? So this was the, this was the, the context of the framework to, for ethical AI development. It's not guaranteed, though, that everybody building AI is going to take this approach to it. Um, but that's, that's the hope, um, but it's not the, the guarantee. Um, so next, I want to move on to, to robots. And this, was a, this was a fun one. Um, so why is it becoming a big deal now? Well, from a technology standpoint, and Moore's Law, there's a bunch of things that have happened at a hardware level that have made um, different applications of robots much more possible now than in the past. Um, 
there's this kind of stages of how robots are entering our lives. So today it's predominantly at a manufacturing level. Today is predominantly at a manufacturing level. So a lot of automation, uh, you know, there's a lot of reports in, uh, in China of factories uh, starting to use uh, forms of robots to do dangerous tasks during a manufacturing process. Uh, the next evolution we'll start to see is at work, in workplaces, um, and then in the home, and then in healthcare institutions, and then in the classroom. So as robots become cheaper, but also safer, and better and faster, uh, we'll start to see them appear in these different stages of our, our lives. Have any of you heard of Scratch? It's a programming language for robots. Uh, when I was down in the valley, I have a, a cousin's daughter, and one of them is six years old. Um, she just did a one-week summer camp to program a robot. And she's six years old. So that speaks to the culture and, and, and some of the things that are happening. Um, and it's happening today. So uh, a couple things that I interacted with that I wanted to share. So on the Left here is the beam. It costs about $15,000. It's about this big. And uh, super, super cool. It's the first generation. Essentially, it's a form of telepresence. And uh, I got to use one. I got to be in one. I got to interact with one. Um, they have the, a store in downtown Palo Alto where they don't have a single employee in the store. <coughs> All of the employees are sitting elsewhere in the world. And they're interacting with you through this. The store never locks its doors. It's open 24 seven. They have people all over the world. And they have these running around on the street that are getting you to come into the store. <laughs> so it's the equivalent of a robot coming and tapping you on the shoulder. It's somebody's face speaking to you. Uh, but it's being used in workplaces, companies that have remote offices. Uh, now, we're not going to buy one of these for 15K, although at the end, I was pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the second generation or third generation, I could see us having this. One in New York, one in London, one here. And it was, it was really interesting to, to play with it. So that's robots entering the workplace, right? It's safe, it's good, it's just not cheap yet. But I suspect in the next 12 to 24 months it'll get cheap enough that a company like us will be able to afford it. Um, this, is, this is one of DARPA's robots. So DARPA is a defense agency for the US government. Um, they're the most advanced. They're investing more in robotics than pretty much everybody else combined. And they're trying to replace a lot of dangerous tasks, be it nuclear disasters, be it war situations, be it rescue situations, and bring robots into the picture. I need one to go to data center. <laughs> <laughs> simply sit at my desk. Um, and then, has anybody seen what this is? Yeah. This is the Megabot. Um, so it was there, we got to play with it and take pictures with it and stuff. This is about a two and a half story, it's the closest thing you'll, I've seen to an tr actual transformer. Uh, somebody does sit inside, and the guys who are creating it, uh, they came out of Singularity uh, University, um, they're treating it like a sport, as a form of entertainment. So basically saying this is the next evolution of something like NASCAR. They're like, it's gonna have ads all over it, you're gonna compete, and they've challenged uh, another team in Japan to a duel, which is going to happen next year. Yeah. And they're approaching ro robots from a form of sport and entertainment, saying the Hollywood entertainment industry is bigger than a lot of the other industries that robots are being used for. Um, so they're trying to disrupt entertainment. And then here are a few things that aren't as far away as we may think. Um, so this is, this is Pepper. Um, it's out of, I believe, Japan, and it's a robot that uh, costs $1,500, is focused on the elderly or disabled or depressed, and is a robot focused on companionship. Uh, they showed the robot, they showed videos of it in action, um, it's pretty, pretty cool that people um, who struggle or may otherwise live alone uh, in solving a companionship uh, challenge. Uh, so that was interesting to see. Um, the drones, we've got an entire talk on drones. Um, that's why they gave us those little mini drones. Um, the FAA uh, is actually very involved in trying to figure out how to regulate the airspace in a world with drones. 
and there's a lot of companies investing in it. Um, there's a lot of regulation challenge, and it's the technology that's not the holdup in the case of drones, it's the regulation. Um, but within our lifetime, within our next five to 10 years, I suspect we're going to see different applications of drones. Not full applications, but different applications. Uh, there's one company in the US that's gotten approval from the FAA to use drones to deliver medical supplies. So that's the first That's the first time the FAA has approved the use of drones in normal airspace. That's happened this year. Uh, pets, so uh, we got to play with one of these guys. Uh, it's a robot, but very pet-like. And they did the research up to a three-year-old kid has no idea that it's a robot. Can you have one of those? Yeah, was, we have one in the back. Where's yeah. Tiki? Where is yours, Tiki? That's on my old desk. <laughs> Once you realize there's a robot, you put it on. <laughs> but, so this is this is this is, robot, it's a human. <laughs> so th this is probably in its second or third generation. But fast forward a few generations, and like we've seen with the iPhone and other devices, it's pretty much every year you get a new generation of these things. So today a three-year-old can't tell the difference. Then next year might be a four-year-old, and then it might be a five-year-old, then it might be a six-year-old. Um, changes our relationship. Our relationship with robots is changing. And finally, I want to show you Gmail. This is your toothbrush. These are your things. But these are the things that matter. And somewhere in between is this guy. Introducing Jibo, the world's first family robot. Say hi, Jibo. Hi, Jibo. <laughs> Jibo helps everyone out throughout their day. He's the world's best camera man. By intelligently tracking the action around him, you can independently take video and photos so that you can put down your camera and be a part of the scene. Do you want to Take a picture. He's a hands free helper. You can talk to him and help. I didn't get to play with Jiva, but that's shipping this November and it's going to cost $500. Um, so there are a bunch of limitations uh, with robots. Um, Power and batteries are uh, probably the biggest limitation. Batteries are a very, very expensive form of energy storage. It's a bad idea to give robots guns. <laughs> and that's going to be one of the limitations of how to... So we have autonomous weapons already. We're building autonomous you know, bots. And the risk and the threat of the two of them coming together. Huge opportunity for security, but that's going to be the next kind of wave in robotics is the need for more security and protocols and, and structure. Uh, so those are some of the things that are uh, that are needed and the opportunities within robots. Uh, let's touch on energy. It's something we, we feel every day, whether we realize it or not. Uh, so 2014 was the hottest year ever on the Earth. Uh, 2015 is going to crush that. So this global warming thing is, is real. Uh, California has been in drought for five years straight. And uh, there was some theory going around and then discussed at the conference around, uh, what if this is not a drought? What if this is actually the new norm for California? And I thought it was interesting that a third of the CO2 in the air comes from transportation, and primarily cars and buses. Trains and planes actually don't contribute that much CO2 relatively, uh, but cars and buses are the biggest contributors. So when I got back from New York last night, I took the train downtown instead of the uh, inspired because of that. So where do we get our energy from today? It's these three sources. Um, we're not really addicted to fossil fuel fuels, but we're addicted to energy on demand and the lack of viable storage options for solar and wind is what's getting in the way of us moving on from these sources of energy. So 95% of US energy comes from burning stuff. When you burn stuff, other bad stuff happens. So solar and wind um, is about 2% of the energy today. It's tiny. And although it's growing really, really fast, it's not expected to make much of a dent in the next little while, as in the next 10 to 20. So history does give us hope, though, when we look at climate change. So the one example that uh, stuck with me was acid rain. Some of you may remember, like 15, maybe 20 years ago, 
There was a lot of talk around acid rain. Thirty years ago, I wasn't born. Let's just, let's just say the <laughs> eighties. <laughs> there was a lot of talk around acid rain, but they, then they walked us through how we, as a society, solve that. And it was through these three things lining up: this technology and better processes, uh, government policy that was phased in. It wasn't kind of overnight. It was phased in, uh, and the businesses innovating. So the same thing is already happening in CO two and, and other aspects of the climate. Um, it's just a question of, do these things, are they going to line up fast enough, or are we going to get there? But there is, um, there is hope. I'm actually going to have to skip this because of time. This, this concept is really interesting to me, that inversion adoption. So when we look at how energy is changing and where it's going to change first, it's not going to be here. So India, Africa, China, Brazil, um, places where the power grid has not yet been set up, um, those are the places that have already started to adopt um, different types of energy grids, different forms of energy. Um, and that's, that's pretty interesting to watch. So, uh, China is investing more in renewable energies than every other country in the world combined right now. So fast forward five years from now, ten years from now, you know, where is that adoption going to happen? It's going to happen there. Okay. And then, last topic, which we'll call Humans 3.0. Um, this was totally outside of any of my knowledge or comfort zone or domain. And uh, I found it that much more interesting. I think that's why. So I'm going to ask. A, I'm going to take a quick survey here. Um, the question is, how long do you want to live? And four options: uh, 80 years, 120 years, 150 years, or indefinite. So how many people here want to live to 80? Just 80, or? Pick one of the four. Okay. One twenty. Are these all good years or? Are <laughs> <laughs> that's See, that's why I chose eighty. That's, that's, you have to consider that for yourself. One fifty. You have great, great, great grandkids, Jeffy. Okay. <laughs> that's all you have. Great, oh, great, great grandkids, and indefinite. It's a very, very mixed, very mixed. Um, in the last 150 years, we've increased our average lifespan from 40 years to 80 years. We've doubled our lifespan in the last 150 years. So 100 years from now, it is not that uh, far from potentially happening where we maybe double our lifespan again. So this is a key reason why. So our, our DNA. Um, I'm now interested and motivated to get my DNA sequence to, to understand and learn more. So in 2000, um, the Genome Project, the first DNAs were sequenced. So the DNA has 3.2 million, sorry, 3.2 billion uh, data points. Um, it costed $3 billion to sequence the first DNA in 2000. Today, in 2015, it costs $1,000. And by 2020, it'll be free. So far in the U.S., about a quarter million people have had their DNA sequenced, and uh, Obama has put some incentives on the table to get to a million, because I think that's a minimum critical data set to actually start to understand it. So now what's also happening is we're, we've also built technology to essentially reprogram DNA. So we've understood a sequence and understand DNA, and then we understand how to reprogram it. So if we look at something like a cancer, a cancer is when your DNA or your cells it's essentially started hours. <laughs> the answer is when, you, when your DNA, um, when your cells essentially yeah, attack each other and start to do stupid things because uh, they're confused. And um, through the DNA sequencing, we're understanding what's actually happening. And there have been examples where we're starting to reprogram our DNA to avoid cancers. 
the, a belief, you know, that within 10 to 20 years, all cancers will be understood and be preventable, thanks to DNA sequencing, which is really about understanding 3.2 billion data points and, and what to do with them. Um, within the medical industry, a, a new approach to solving and diagnosing problems, CrowdMed has popped up as a platform in, in the US where you can crowdsource your diagnosis when you're a medical clinician. And uh, it's really popular, and it's actually working. Um, there's something called these biohacking labs, where a lot of the equipment around understanding your DNA, understanding and testing viruses, um, they're opening up all over the place. There's a bunch in Canada already, they're all over California, um, where anybody can go and start to experiment um, from a biotech standpoint. Um, so kids in California had built, uh, in one of these labs, cow-free milk and cheese by splicing cow DNA. And then when we look at how doctors work today, it's, it's really inefficient in terms of how they diagnose patients. It's a one-to-many, we're trying to, it's a lot of guesswork. Um, 5,000 new papers are published every year in the medical profession. The average doctor does not read the 5,000 papers that are published to understand what's happening. So this is where technology can come. So there's this notion of assisted, uh, assisted medicine, which is really an AI assisting a doctor with access and ability to understand all this data. Smart rooms, this was, um, this was really interesting. This was definitely a look into the future. So imagine um, a room in the future, a bedroom in the future, where the breadth of a baby can be measured, where the mirror that you're looking in the morning can sense your pulse rate and your heart rate. I'll Photoshop you. <laughs> so where, <you're> better. <laughs> where, your, where your toothbrush can analyze your saliva or sequence your, your DNA. I forget the, uh, the specific name of it, but um, we've built this technology and it's been 3D printed now around ear implants that are um, semi-permanent. Then the trend and the belief is that within 20 years, every human will be able to hear everything clearly not suffer from hearing loss when, uh, when we age. Um, artificial retina resolution is, is growing, and there's a belief that um, it'll be stronger than the human retina. So in the future, we might even be able to see stronger than we're able to see today. So it's hearing loss, sight loss, those things kind of go away. So then on, on the notion of sensing, and this is where apps came in, um, so they made the analogy to how dogs sense fear. What if your phone in the future senses emotions? So the sensors are evolving. We're seeing them in a lot of different devices and the internet of things. And in the future, um, we'll have apps that will sense different things. So it could be a food allergy. I mean, to find a new way to discover if you're allergic to something, you will download that app, and it will tell you if you have that food allergy uh, or a dust allergy. So just like, like the phone that uh, I bought two years ago is running software that was developed two weeks ago, we'll be done soon. <laughs> and then we will all do yoga. <laughs> um, so the notion of apps changing the way we understand and interact with our body and our environment. Um, and then the healthcare model. So uh, this kind of says it all, but today our model is very facility-centered around the institution and the evolution to be patient-centered, where the patient is at the center of it, where a health record is owned by the patient versus the facility. And in this model, we're going to start to see a lot more innovation because patients are going to demand of the different services around them for more stuff versus waiting on the facilities to, to innovate and get there. So that's, those are just some of the things. It was, it was really challenging for me to recap an entire week of class into, uh, into about 25 minutes. But those are some of the things that uh, piqued my interest and definitely got me thinking longer term, bigger picture, uh, and a lot more even hopeful, frankly, about how technology is influencing, changing, and impacting, and in many ways can save uh, a lot of the, and address a lot of the challenges that we have. 
I hope you enjoyed that and took something away from it. Thank you. Okay, we've got one more um, quick announcement. So on the table.